Hi there, I'm Barbara Turley and you're watching Feminine Wealth TV, the show that uncovers the diamond tips on creating truly conscious wealth from change makers, world shakers and wealth creators. I'm joined on the show today from stunning Bali, where a friend of mine, Ness Campagnaro, has a beautiful business, a kind of an integrated jewelry design business. And she's been living on the island of Bali for the last five years. So I'm excited that she's on the show today. Ness, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Hey, Barbara. Thanks for having me. Good. So I see that you're in your lovely Balinese garden there where we were supposed to do the interview last week while I was there, yeah. but the weather went against us. And unfortunately, I'm back in Sydney now where it's winter. It's a lot drier now and the sky is very blue. It's perfect. perfect. Oh, perfect weather. I'll have to get back there pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Ness, look, I was so keen to have you on the show because, you know, you, I love your journey. You know, you've had many, many different businesses, but they're all been in the creative space. But you also have moved to many different countries. You've lived sort of all over the world. So I'm really interested to know where your entrepreneurial journey kind of started. Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? I always wanted to be an entrepreneur because my parents were entrepreneurs. They were both yeah. antique dealers. And they taught me everything that I knew about gems. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom's a gemologist. Oh, and okay. um, I think several years of uh, being a small child and sleeping under tables at the antique markets um, gave me the bug of yeah. being interested in the jewelry business. And also watching how much freedom my parents had to come and go and do as they pleased. And that's what I wanted. Wow. And did they, so they actually did have that freedom even as, because lots of entrepreneurs feel like they go into business to get freedom and then realize, ow, oh, it's not that freeing because there's so much to do. So they actually did have that sense of freedom. Well, my parents always felt that time was the freedom and to be able to spend time with their children and to also have a very, you know, get up and go life, being able to pick up and go whenever they wanted to to travel and that bug just I guess rubbed off on me as well. Mm -hmm. So when did you start your first business then? Was it straight out of school or? Yeah, well, it was actually out of school and then just uh, my first year of university. I yeah. started a jewelry business making small chokers that you could just wear around the neck on a piece of leather. It was actually at the time when the American Indian sort of big fashion thing was going on and yeah. I, I really just jumped, I pig, piggy tailed on the back of it really. Yeah. And um, I started just selling a lot of them at the student union. And then uh, another student said, why don't you go to another student union and do it there? And then that collectively ended up being seven, I think uh, maybe 10 mm. student unions across London where we were setting up, oh, I had a business wow. partner, we were setting up yeah. stands and selling these chokers and bracelets and it went from there and then we made yeah. enough money, we actually parted ways. He went off and finished his MA and I, um, went off and started working selling jewelry in nightclubs mm. in the early mornings um, and then a call came to go and do a bit of fashion work in Tokyo so I dropped everything and ran there. Wow so that was the first kind of big move I guess you know moving to Tokyo wow. Yeah that... well after I finished my degree but during mm. my degree I also worked um, in Paris for a little bit because um, we had a six month period where we could do what we wanted to do yeah. and I also went over to San Francisco and worked for a fashion designer over there during my my period off I guess. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Tokyo, did you, you, you didn't run your own business there did you? No, no I was, I was actually briefly working um, as a patent cutter for yeah. uh, another company and uh, it was very brief because it was hard days yeah. and um, a friend from Australia had written to me, that's when people used to write to each other, yeah, yeah, and said, why, um, why don't you come and check out Australia? So that's what I did, and I, I dropped my bags down there and said, wow, this is a really fantastic place. It's somewhere I think I'd like to have my home. Yeah. And that's how Australia started. Yeah, yeah. And I then decided to develop my skills because at that time in the fashion market, um, Lisa Ho and Colette Dinigan owned the space. Oh, wow, and yeah. And I, I didn't really come with a lot of money in my pocket. I knew it was going to take, and I didn't know anyone either, so it was not easy to raise capital to do something like that, to have a fashion business. 
So um, I realized that there was a need for graphic design. Mm -hmm. And so with another two partners, uh, over a period of six months, we clubbed together, put our heads together, and, and set up NARA Design Studio oh, okay. in 1999. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And was it easy? I mean, you said mentioned there was two partners there. You've always kind of gravitated towards having partners. I know because you have a partner in the current business as well, don't you? That's Talk to me about that because partnerships are quite hard. That, you know, a lot of people find partnerships very difficult. And I've had a few people on the show that have um, had successful ones and they've given really good tips as to how to make them work. So I'm interested in what your tips are there because you said yours have worked over the years as well, the partnerships. They have. I mean, you have to decide who's got, you know, it's all about strengths yeah. and, and not vying for attention and reducing ego. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you find someone who is the money person, they're the money person. Yeah. You are the creative person. You might have a project man manager who is managing projects, um, a sales person. Everyone has their own skills and their own talents, but the most important thing is that you, you all know each other's talents yeah. and appreciate each other's talents, and then collectively you can work together. Yeah, that's really good advice, I think, because I think the tendency, particularly with women, is to have a friend and say, hey, let's go into business together, but sometimes they're the same, and then that doesn't really work because both of them are trying to... Right, and I've done that, and yeah. it's been really fantastic. It's been a journey for me. I mean, not too recently I had a partnership with a girlfriend and we both love jewelry and we both wanted to you know conquer the world yeah. but both of us weren't had didn't have the entrepreneurial skill I had it I had the freedom she actually worked for someone else she didn't have the freedom that I had mm -hmm. and I think the push came to shove was for me I need someone who's probably a little bit more hungry mm -hmm. than, than that person was and hence now I have a new partner who is uh, we match quite well we have different skills yeah um, I, I'm the, actually the marketing arm and the people arm the communicator mm. and she is the teacher of our jewelry studio um, mm. and it, it works really really well yeah and that's that's brilliant I mean that's really good advice to give because I know a lot of people they don't want to go into business by themselves they'd rather have partners but it can be a minefield absolute minefield so tell me as well I mean you've you know, you have obviously from the sounds of it, you've gone morphed from different businesses, you've been very fluid and you've gone through different countries, different businesses, different business partners. How do you stay grounded? How do you, how do you stay the well, course? I think that? it's about, well, it's all about adapting mm. to your environment. Um, you have to go with the flow and there are going to be roadblocks all along the way and you have to be able to think, okay, well, it's could be contingency plans mm. that you have in place you know if this doesn't work maybe we'll go with this uh, in many cases you don't even know when those uh, things are going to happen uh, yeah. it could be an economic crisis it could be in fact the, the graphic design studio that I had yeah. that was our biggest problem uh, economic crisis in mm. Australia I mean Australia didn't really get it as much as as the rest of Europe but uh, graphic design and design mm. in general suffered quite a lot in 2007, 2008, yeah. and I was actually toying with the idea of, of leaving and, and going, I guess, home, which if, we, if you can has, you know, think about what home is, to me, it's home is everywhere, but yeah. uh, England is where my, my family are from, and they had an, an idea that maybe I should weather the storm in Australia, come back, work for the family business, and maybe then go back to Australia once mm. the economy was better. But being the feisty person that I am, yeah. I thought, oh, I can conquer this. I'm going to change my life. I'm just going to change it around. Maybe, maybe graphic design isn't what I should do anymore. Maybe I should go back into my passion jewelry. And where can I do that? That's amazing. So that's all... You know, what I love about that story, actually, is that two things, I would say. Number one, I think lots of creatives, and I'm going to generalize here and say lots of women, because I think... Women look at the, the things like the economy, the money markets, uh, you know, the investing world with kind of like, oh, that I don't I'm not interested in that. And I always kind of say, yeah, but you need to be interested because as things start to come down the, ch the tracks, you know, it can really impact your business. And if your eyes are shut, you don't see it coming. So you can't morph and change. So and the other thing I just sort of picked up from what you were saying is that you quickly changed ta tack. You made a decision. You realized, you know what, it's the economy, it's not me. 
the business isn't working right now, so let's go somewhere and do something that, first of all, I'm passionate about, and second of all, I believe is going to work. Yeah. So how quickly did you close down the graphic thing, or did you? Very quickly. It took a few months. Um, I think being able to adapt, uh, especially in today's modern world, is yeah. really, really important. I mean, tomorrow in Bali there could be a crisis as well. Mm. I just, you just have to not have the fear. It's all about not having fear. Yes. And um, I think always for a person starting their first business, there's gonna have, there's gonna be fear. Yeah. And feel it. That's yeah, the most you're, you're important thing. Yeah, you're afraid to make a mistake. But, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think people are afraid to make a mistake. But the thing is, you will make mistakes. There will be roadblocks. You will make mistakes. The economy will fall in a heap. Your clients will leave. You know, it, it'll be all those things. Yeah. Well, I, and I always looked to John Singleton, uh, yeah. who had, you know, still has big advertising agency in Australia and, and hands in all kinds of other different businesses. He's been bankrupted seven times. I know, and he and doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't care. Yeah. He gets up, he dusts himself off, and he goes for it. Yeah. And I think we have to do that. If, yeah. I mean, if you're going to succeed at some point, just get back on that horse and keep going. Yeah, well, a lot of people give up before the tipping point where they're just on the verge of success and they give up. And actually on the bankruptcy thing, it's really interesting. I did a live Google Hangout a few weeks ago. I do live Google Hangouts every Friday and people can ask me questions online. And one girl in America asked me, how do you deal with the embarrassment or the judgment of others when you've had to declare bankruptcy? And I just said that to her. I was like, oh my God, do you think that Donald Trump cares about that? I mean, he went bankrupt twice, you know, for a billion dollars. So, you know, it's Not this whole thing of, as women, I think we, and maybe it's a generalization again, but we tend to have all these emotions attached to this thing, this shame or guilt around, you know, bankruptcies or debt or, yeah. you know, failure or whatever. Yeah. And it really stops us from moving forward. There is one very important uh, point that I would like to make about bankruptcy, yeah. only because I've had a taste of it myself. Okay, yeah. Um, in Australia, if you are no longer a company and you become a sole trader, yes, you are yes. liable for your debt. Now, if you are a company and you're registered as a company, your company takes on the debt. Um, and with my personal liability, it can shut you down as a person. Yeah. So my hope is that um, people listening to this will think very clearly, get a really, really sound accountant, someone who can give them the very best advice on setting up their business. Um, mm -hmm. The cheapest is not nearly the best. Yeah. The most expensive doesn't give you everything either. Just find someone you can have a good chat to, someone that really understands your business or tries to understand your business and give you good advice. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, you know, because one of the things that I really talk about a lot is this first two things, the importance of your, you, I call them your dream team. So that's like, you know, the people around you that are going to help you on your way. But also this thing yeah. of everybody goes for the sole trader thing because it's easy and it's simple and accountants generally tell you to do that and that's fine. But actually I think a lot of people are really not realizing that to save the couple of hundred bucks a year it might cost you in ASIC fees or you know a company, it's, it's sometimes it's just not worth it. You know, it's, it's particularly when you have partners, partners in business, Absolutely. which I know I remember now that story with you that you had a partner involved in that situation. Yes, yeah. and who wasn't actually on paper a director, and yeah. all of the problems fell on the directors, and I was one of those directors. So, yeah. just make it really, really super clear from the beginning. Everyone mm -hmm. needs to know exactly where they stand, and and as you said, a dream team also includes a really good accountant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that was one of the hardest things that ever happened to you in business? That particular situation, that sort of. Did you go bankrupt or did you just come close? No, came close. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> dodged that bullet. Moved dodged to Bali. It. But I know that I know a couple of my girlfriends who are also entrepreneurs that have seen many years of wealth and yeah. are actually feeling the pinch now as well and, and they're having to rethink. And they've had conversations with me about how do I do it? Yeah. Um, and it, again, we get back to that word adapting see where there are areas of your business that are much more lucrative. Um, concentrate. Don't span yourself out too 
yeah. far and wide. Or if you do, keep your overheads down as low as possible. Mm. And hence, that's why I'm actually in Bali working from here now. Yeah. Um, labor is cheaper. Uh, overheads are cheaper. Um, I, I'm not saying Australia is a bad place to run a business. It's not. It's mm. given me many years of uh, love and but times are changing and we all need to yeah to move adapt. yeah i mean i like what you said there about because it's very focused i think so many of us get carried away with oh let's do this and let's do this and let's do all these things and then you think well where's the actual revenue coming from and where like i said to you when we were there the numbers have no emotions they never lie so if you stick to the numbers sure. you know the numbers never lie so too many people get carried away on the ideas and they don't watch the revenue lines and the costs which is really the the trick i guess with making it happen well and i like your trick which is okay what are the figures double it yeah i like that <laughs> you're meaning the costs because Although those are real costs yeah, yeah. the costs involved yeah, double yeah. it yeah double them and then you have and double have the time that's involved. a buff rate. you have something to fall back on right yeah so yeah. I always say double the cost when you when you're doing costings, double them and double triple the time it'll take because it will take three times the length of time. Yeah, you know, because so many good ideas fall over actually, not because the idea wasn't good, but the person ran out of money too early. That's, that's a right. classic. That's right. Yeah, that's classic. Um, how we've started this new business mm. is slow and steady wins the race, and it's really yeah. um, very much an artisan built business we love what we're doing mm. it's very very slow overheads are very low but it's slowly gathering speed now yeah and it doesn't feel stressful and that's really important in women's lives as well we already have enough stress mm. across the board try and reduce that stress do something that you love if you're banging your head against the wall every day and going oh everyone's just not doing what I'm asking them to do and um, Nothing sort of weaving well yeah, together. Yeah. I think you need to take a deep breath, sit back, work out, take a snapshot view of your business, and work out what it is that might not be yeah. melding. Because it together. might be it might be you. <laughs> this is yeah. it might be ourselves. You know, going. I don't it like it. Totally be you. It yeah. can totally be you. And health is a really really important part of that as well. Keeping yeah. healthy. Mm. Stress levels can do horrible things to the body. Yeah. You must be able to do, have a strong head for business yeah. and you must look after your body. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things and I want to talk a little bit now about the actual, one of the things I love about the business you've built there is that, yes, it's a jewelry business. So I sort of said, you know, this is a jewelry business, but it has all these different elements to it. So you've got a, this jewelry workshop, you've got this beautiful guest house that runs jewelry inspired experiences. And then you've got like the design studio and then you have this I know bubbling in the background, I know you're working on something to do with more sort of bigger distribution model behind the jewelry. So talk yeah. to me about each of those little elements and what, 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 what you do in each part and then what made you decide to put each of these elements into the business. Again, it's like this thing that was go with the flow. Everything seemed to just go from one thing to another and, mm. and, they, all, and they all connect as well. So we started off with a guest house. Mm. and. Uh, that gave me a space to be creative. Uh, it's, it's a very calm environment. Mm -hmm. And we moved on to building a little workshop uh, next door. Mm. Um, and we didn't know what kind of workshop. And when I say we, it's me and my husband. Yeah. Uh, at first, we were, we were thinking, oh, it would be a really good place to have maybe a yoga studio. Someone would like to do yoga there. And then one day, uh, he said to me, why don't you just turn it into a jewelry studio? I mean, that's what you want to do. And I said, that's a great idea. Now all I need to do is find someone to do it with because I'm much more motivated when I have someone working with me. Yeah, yeah. And I had started a Tuesday night at the um, guest house for local people that had just moved to Sonora. It was called the Sonora Springboard. Mm -hmm. And it was basically for women who were fit feeling a little bit um, unsettled, had just moved to Bali, needed a shoulder to cry on, needed somewhere to have a glass of wine yeah. and uh, have, have a chat with other women who were feeling the same way. And when these women started coming and there was one moment I was looking around the house and I was thinking, there's 30 women here. <laughs> wow, all feeling the same way. 
they're all feeling the same way and they're all feeling powerless. They're all feel, yeah. They all feel like they want to do something here. Some of them were here with partners and their children. Some of them were here working. Some of them were here on a sabbatical holiday, yeah. maybe six months to a year, deciding what they wanted to do. Um, so they were from all different walks of life. Yeah experiences and one of the women that came ended up being my business partner Selenia so I'm oh, very grateful yes. yeah wow that's amazing and you know what I love there about that story as well is the power of what I call a mastermind so it's the people that you surround yourself with the power of that for your creativity and your stress level I guess you know we all particularly when we're running our own businesses we need to have a group around us of women who are doing the same thing and who are feeling the same way yeah. Yes, yeah. and yeah. the energy is so positive. Everyone wants to either help each other or give advice, mm. and uh, you walk away, walk out the door, feeling, oh, this this was a really positive experience. Mm. And I have my sisters with me. They're backing me. They're behind me. Yes, the sisterhood, the sense the of sisterhood. Sister yeah, yeah. That's right. So. I want to talk a little bit now about the, the future of this business. So I know you've been working on something in the background in this whole distribution model. And what's the kind of big vision, I guess, for you and for this business and for your future there in Bali? Well, the jewelry workshops are going really, really well. We're teaching people that are here on the island to make jewelry. We're, and it's predominantly silver jewelry. Yeah. And we're also offering packages to tourists that are coming to stay and want to open up a creative site. Mm. Um, and from that, what we've also found is we're getting a lot of inquiries for people that actually want to make small lines of jewelry themselves. Mm. So what we've done is we're helping them put their own designs together, maybe giving them a better understanding of dimensions and how to put pieces together mm -hmm. um, and help them on their way. And we've done that pretty successfully now for a couple of um, customers, uh, Argentina and uh, mm. South Africa. Wow. And we're working some Australian girls right now on getting their collection together as well. But in the background, our, our main aim is to show at a big show, a gem show, and oh. launch our own line. Yeah, right, street, okay. Yeah. Which we'll have to name at some point. We're working on that too. But that's, yeah. that's the big plan. And then distribution. We're looking predominantly at China and Malaysia as mm. our market. Yeah, huge market. Absolutely massive huge. market, yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I love actually about your journey? I mean, we've really talked about your entrepreneurial journey is that you started out with this sort of jewelry love and design and you've come full circle and you've come right back and actually it's your passion it's that's pushing you circle. forward. It's It's so bizarre. Yeah. You know, I, I, my mother, for instance, I had that conversation with my mum because she's been all around the world. She's been everywhere and she's yeah. ended up back living where she lived when she she was 15 years old wow. and she said it's exactly the same thing. She's come full circle. I've come full circle in business. I feel this is where I'm going. This is my passion, my joy. Mm. Uh, working with my hands every day is a meditation and also counseling people who come. I love doing that as well. Having mm. a chat with women that are coming to the workshop is predominantly women. We get men as well, yeah. but predominantly women. And you know, we, the very first thing that they say when they walk in is, oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I've never done anything like this. Yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. And then when they walk out with, they're looking at a ring that they've made or a pendant that they've made and they, mm. they're absolutely astounded with their creative ability. I know we've done our job. Yeah. And that, that lights your heart up. Yeah. It does. Working with people really lights yeah. my heart up. Yeah. So Ness, if people watching just love this idea and they're heading to Bali on holiday and they'd love to either, you know, go to the guest house, do one of your experiences making jewellery, or they are interested in looking at some of your lines and maybe taking on, uh, getting you to design something for them, where should they go to get in touch with you? Well, we have a website. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, sonorjewellerystudio.com. Mm -hmm. S A N U R for yep. Sonor. Jewelry is J E W E L L E R Y dot yep. com. It's the English spelling of jewelry. We'll have it on um, there. It should be here right now. So it should be showing. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to get in touch with me personally, it's info at sonorjewelrystudio.com. Great. And uh, really good to answer pretty quickly. So if there's anything that you want to talk about, please mm. feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, particularly anyone who, in Bali who is watching who maybe has just gone there and 
is starting a business in Bali. That's the other thing. I mean, you, we didn't touch on that today, but you started a business in a foreign country, which is quite difficult to do. That is another story in itself. Yeah. But yes, uh, there is red tape involved in setting up a company here. Yeah. Uh, it's important, to ha again, to have good people behind you that can help you to do that. Yeah, yeah. And a bit of a mastermind, I guess, around you there when you get there. So Ness is yes. your woman if you go to Bali. <laughs> you need some help, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Ness, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. And I'm just devastated I didn't get to do the show from Bali when I was there with you. But it was good having a glass of wine with you anyway. <laughs> it was fabulous. And it's only a hop, skip and a jump. You'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back pretty soon. To do one of the workshops, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I'll do, I'll do a workshop next time, definitely. <laughs> definitely. And thanks everyone for watching for another week of Feminine Wealth TV. Remember that you can catch me later this week on my podcast, Wealth Unplugged, where I'm going to be giving you my key takeouts for my chat today with Ness. So remember also to come back next week for more Feminine Wealth TV.